welcome to worship services at Pilgrim Branch MB Church, located on 4033 Highway 471 in the land of Ocean Springs. We're excited that you're with us this morning and we're with you this morning to worship God together in the beauty of His holiness. This time, ask you just to bow your heads just for a moment of prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you for this beautiful morning, Father. We thank you, Father, for all that you've done through us throughout this week, Father. Lord, we come, Father, worshiping you in the beauty of your holiness, Father. Thank you for all that you've done for us, Father. Ask you, Father, to forgive us of our sins and cast them as far as the east as for the west. And, and create in us a, a clean heart, Father. Renew our understanding of you, Father. Renew our soul, Father, that we may dance before you, Father. And praise your holy name, Father. We come today and ask you to look down upon this word that we live in, Father. Father, we said in the word of your people, which are called by thy name, shall humble themselves and pray. We come humble as we know, Father. We come seeking your name, Father. Father, forgive us we've not turned from our wicked ways, but give us the strength, Father, the compassion to turn, Father, because we're ready to hear from heaven, Father. We're ready for you to forgive us of our sin and to heal our land. We thank you, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. Let me read this to us. 
And it came to pass, as he went into the house of one of the chief Pharisees to eat bread on the Sabbath day, that they watched him. And behold, there was a certain man before him which had the dropsy. Now, dropsy is a an older medical term for edema or swelling. How many of y'all ever been a, at least a little swollen before in your life? This man had some severe swelling. Wow. And Jesus answered and spake unto the lawyers and Pharisees, saying, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath day? And they held their peace. And he took him and healed him and let him go. And answered them, saying, Which of you shall have an ass or an ox fallen into a pit and will not straightway pull him up out of on under a Sabbath day. And they could not answer him again to these things. And they put forth a parable to those which were bidden, when he marked how they chose out the chief room, saying unto them, When thou art bidden of any man to a wedding, sit not down in the highest room, lest a more honorable man than thou be bidden of him. And he that bade thee and him come and said to thee, Give this man place, and thou begin with shame to take the lowest room. But when thou art bid, and go and sit down in the lowest room, that when he that bade thee come, he may say unto thee, Friend, go up higher. Then shalt thou have worship in the presence of them that sit at me with thee. For whosoever exalted himself shall be abased. And he that humbled himself shall be exalted. And looking back at 14 and 1, it said that they watched. We're going to talk about some table manners. Table manners. Jesus' ministry was marked by fellowship, communion, and eating with a variety of people. At some point in the ministry, he felt it necessary to share a set of table manners for those gathered at the table. And these manners are instructions to us. Now, God does some of his best work at the table. That's why the psalmist said, Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head, my cup running over. He did it at the table. It all happens at the table. Peter was criticized in the book of Acts because they criticized him for sitting at the table with uncircumcised people. There, there was tensions at the table. And it's interesting that Luke, who writes the Gospel of St. Luke, is also the author of the book of Acts. And over and over again, he brings us to the table. He tells us that the early church continued steadfast in the apostles' doctrine and breaking of bread and fellowship and going from house to house. Luke keep taking us back to the table. To the table and again we're at the table. Now for an, for a, for an orthodox Jew to eat at the table it was more than the consumption of food. It was a sign of fellowship. They did not eat with Gentiles. They did not eat with those they considered heathens. They did not eat with the Samaritans. If a Gentile was to sit at the table with a Jew, they would break the plate. It was considered unclean. It was considered so the eating was a sign of a covenant and close relationship. It could take hours to consume a meal because it was a big deal to sit at the table. The fellowship of the covenant of the relationship between you and the table was even more important than the food itself. The food was just a, a backdrop to the fellowship that took place at the table. And so in the scripture, Luke, we see Jesus at this dinner party. And he asked them in Luke 14 and 3, is it lawful for me to heal on the Sabbath? In other words, is it lawful? I'm here at this dinner, but is it lawful for me to do my thing in your house? And, and that's why, and that's what he's asking you this morning. Is it lawful for me to do my thing in your house? I know it's your house, but I want to know, do you mind if I can be myself? If you let me be myself, I can 
bring a miracle into this house. If you let me be myself, I can bring a miracle to your table. If, if you let me be myself, I can deal with your child. But I want to know, is it lawful or do you have a law that exempts Jesus from being in your house? You're a Christian at church, but oh no, I, it's unlawful for you to come into my house. Oh, I can, I can, I can praise you on Sunday, but it, but I, do I have a law that I don't want you riding in my car? Is it lawful for me to do my thing at your house? And Luke fourteen four said they held their peace. Sometimes we need to hold our peace. Their silence opened a door for God to move. It opened a door for God to work. And the Bible says that he called the man with this, 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 this dropsy, which is this, 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 this swelling or this edema, and he healed him. So one of the important table matters is the meal should heal. The meal should heal. Notice that Jesus stops right in the middle of a meal and heal. In fact, he puts the folks on notice that the Sabbath is a great time to be healed. Too often we've, we've made fellowship and about seeing and, and being seen. Jesus shows us that our meals should heal. The time together we have with each other should, should be about identifying needs and dealing with them. Have you ever looked around your circle today? Have you ever looked around your home today? Have you looked around your table today? Have you looked around your place of influence or your work today? Or has it all been about fulfilling the desires of your flesh? Have you taken time to notice the pain, the sickness, the needs of those around? Why gather is all you can do is eat. Why consume but never give out? We take in but we never utilize what we're consuming to touch one another. We must arrive every day with the attitude of Jesus is that I expect to be interrupted by need. Jesus walked around the streets expecting somebody to interrupt him and touch the hem of his garment. Jesus walked around the world expecting somebody to interrupt him and say, my brother's dad, dad, he should have been there. Oh no, I'll be by to raise him from the dead. Jesus walked to this dinner party expecting somebody to interrupt him before he could even consume the meal. Do we walk around the day expecting to be interrupted by need? Or do we have the attitude that I just want to nourish myself? The attitude should be, I won't nourish myself before I first nourish someone else. Go back and check how many times Jesus healed around the table. He often healed physical needs, emotional needs, and spiritual needs around the table. And the moment this man in Luke 14 got healed, he sent him away. For this man, the dinner is over. Once he got from the Lord, you can have the food. I never came for the food in the first place. Are you coming for the food or for the Lord? So I never came for the food in the first place. I came because I was hoping to get something more than I could get by myself. And once, once I got what I needed from the Lord, I could go on my way. I didn't come to be seen by you. I didn't come for a photo op. I didn't come so I can add you to my resume. I didn't came. I came that I might see Jesus. And once he got his healed, he got up, left the table. When he left the table, he left Jesus alone with his enemies. And the Bible says at this point, Jesus says in Luke 14, 7, that he noticed how they were fighting for the best seats at the table. So this says to me that while they are watching Jesus, Jesus is watching them. And while he's watching them, he noticed them rushing to get the high seat. Now the high seat is the, is the, the seat closest to the host. 
And whenever you go to a dinner table, whoever sits closest to the host, either to the right or to the left, it's a sign of power and influence. And so they want it to be seen as being powerful people, to be seen as being important people. And so they was fighting to sit at the head of the table as close as they could to the host. And Jesus is just sitting back. Now, if anyone had a right to sit at that table, to sit in that place of the highest honor, it should have been Jesus. Nobody in there was as good as Jesus. Nobody in there was as powerful as Jesus. Nobody in there was as important as Jesus. And yet there are people that are fine trying to get in a position that even Jesus himself is just sitting back looking at. Now imagine if you were the one glass and just been sitting back. <laughs> just sitting back. Looking at. Observing them. Watching them. You know, Jesus just sitting back. Look, he didn't have his Peter, James, and John's there. He didn't have none of his inner circle there. So he was just sitting back. No one day, you know, sometimes they start talking to people. Look, where what they doing? He didn't have no one to talk to. He was just sitting back. Looking at. He comes and now look at Jesus. How strong he is that he comes into a room full of enemies without bringing in a backup with him. Because Jesus is bad all by himself. He doesn't need the disciples to support him. He doesn't need his inner circle to have his back. He doesn't need a, a best friend to cover him. He said, I'm God enough. That I get my, if I get myself into it, I can get myself out of it. And he walked in his room, sat down by himself, and they watching him as if they have the power to decide whether he's right or wrong, and he is sitting back there watching them. To all of you out there who, who's trying to decide whether Christianity is relevant or not, to all of you trying to decide that in the midst of this modern, this society we're in, is there any room for the church today? For all of you who are trying to decide, is the church still relevant while you are, you are set up there with your, your cynical self trying to decide whether the church is relevant or not? You are looking at the church, but the same way you're looking at the church, the church is looking at you. The church is looking at you too. Looking at you, watching you fight for power and position, watching you tear down people in the name of being right and better and superior and smarter, and Jesus is sitting back watching them. Jesus watching them. And all of a sudden, he starts to talk. Now the atmosphere is beginning to change. Because Jesus said, a certain man was having a wedding. Now bear in mind, Jesus is not at a wedding, he's at a dinner. But his story is about a wedding so. And he says, when you go, when you when, when you go where you're invited to a wedding, first thing I'm gonna start with inviting. The very fact that you've been invited is a privilege. So I want to speak to all of those of us who are arrogant, who get offended because you didn't get the best seat. You didn't get to sit up front. Nobody called your name on the program. Nobody did this or that. The very fact that you're invited is an honor. You've been invited to the wedding. But, but when you're invited to the wedding, don't be so self enthroned Don't be so egotistical. Don't be so self-promoting. Don't be so aggressive. Don't be so assertive that you push yourself in beyond what you need to be. Jesus said the wisest thing to do when you come into a great house is not to push yourself into a realm where you set yourself up to be embarrassed. Lift yourself up so high that you set yourself up to be embarrassed. 
He says, because somebody with more honor could come in and the host that had invited you may have to walk you walk up to you and say, excuse me, do you mind sitting over there? The governor of so-and-so has come in and you would have to then get up, pack up your little stuff, have the embarrassment of having everybody watch you go down. It is not wise to puff yourself up, to inflate yourself, to impress people that really don't matter. It is much wiser for you not to inflate your image trying to impress people that don't matter because then all they can feel is disappointment when you come down. Inflate yourself up on Facebook. Inflate yourself up on Instagram. Inflate your resume up on Lincoln and all these different things. Then all of a sudden you feel embarrassed when you come down. The best thing, instead, Jesus said, when you come to a situation that you've been invited into, now I'm not sure who this for, but when you come into a new situation when you're invited to, and somebody might be getting ready to invite to a new audience, a new stage, a new place, and, and God wants you to, to be ready when you step into that. You can't handle this like you handle that. Just because you're big stuff over there don't mean you can be big stuff over there. But when you come yourself into to the, to the, to this new atmosphere or this new place, he said, don't walk in the room and try to push yourself up close to the top. He said, it's far better to take the back seat. He said, because if you take the back seat, if you take the back seat, you open up yourself with the possibility of promotion. When you humble yourself, you become a candidate for a promotion. If you just lower your nose, lower your name, Lord, of bragging about yourself, then you become a candidate of promotion. But if you inflate yourself up so high, then sometimes you get embarrassed when you are demoted. We all want to be able to be in a certain position. That's why God said, humble yourself before me and I will lift you up. If God gets ready to promote you, he'll promote you in spite of a pandemic. If God gets ready to promote you, he'll promote you in spite of the storm. He'll lift you up while other people are falling. A thousand may fall at your right, ten thousand may fall at your left side, but if God gets ready to take you up, God knows how to take you up. I want y'all out there look at somebody and say, I'm coming up. I'm coming up. I'm coming up. They've been walking past me for years, but I'm coming up. They've been making fun of me for years, but I'm coming up. They've been talking about me like a dog, but I'm coming up. I sat there and watched people with less talent walk past me like I was a dog, but I stayed where I was. I kept on praying. I knew that weeping may endure for the night, but joy is coming in the morning. Tick tock, tick. It's morning time for somebody right now. Right now, God is getting ready to raise you in a place that you've never been before and you will be promoted all because you didn't complain, all because you didn't puff yourself up, all because you didn't murmur, but, but you, you clapped when other people succeeded, you held your peace, and you humbled yourself before God. Now God is saying, get ready to pack your bags, pack your bags, because um, I did to take you to another level in the presence of even those who walk past you. The best part of promotion is that God won't promote you secretly. He'll promote you publicly. Right in the faces of all the people that said that you were nothing, said that you would never be nothing, said you were never going to ever have anything. God will promote you publicly in their face. When God get ready to raise you, he'll raise you anyhow. But we must understand but we must humble ourselves. We must humble ourselves. Because see, God hates pride. Pride. That's what he was trying to show him here. This table, man. 
when they observe them rushing and fighting for the best seat. God hates pride. He hates a proud look. He hates a condescending attitude. He hates a self-righteous disposition. What Jesus is trying to teach the Pharisees, look at the teacher teaching the teacher. Look at the rabbi teaching the rabbi. Look at the author teaching the teacher. He said, if you humble yourself in due time, God will exalt you. But if you exalt yourself, you have nowhere to go but down because God hates pride. There are three things in the world. The lust of the eye, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. All those different sins in the world can be traced back either to the lust of the eye, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. And a lot of times when you hear a preacher preach, and he preach about the lust of the eye, he preach about the lust of the flesh. Because those are things that manifest themselves in tangible ways. But pride is invisible. Pride is in pride can wear long dresses. Pride can wear his hair in a bun. Pride can put on a tailored suit. Pride can hide in secret places. Pride does not announce itself. It's an attitude of your heart. And God said if you don't get that pride out of you, there's you're setting yourself up for a fall. Humble me, Lord, at your feet. That should be our prayer. Humble me, Lord, at your feet. Don't let me wear nothing that's too good for me to humble myself at your feet. Don't let me drive nothing that make me so high-minded that I stop humbling myself at your feet. Don't let me have nothing that would keep me so proud that I can't get on my knees at night. God said, I'm going to put you in the new job, but I still want you to praise me like you did when you were on unemployment. I'm getting ready to raise you up, but I want you to stay humble in your spirit because pride is something that God hates. It's not just pride. He said, I hate a proud look. He said, I hate a proud I don't even want you to look like you're proud. I want you to go out of your, your, your way to be humble. The higher I take you, the more humble I want you to be. The more I bless you, the more I want you to bring yourself down. The more I give you, the more I want you to get down at your feet and humble yourself. Uh, that's the kind of talk Jesus done at the table. Table talk. Uh, he wasn't doing a sermon at the table. This was not the beatitude. This was not the Mount of Allah. This was not the Mount of Transfiguration. This is the kind of stuff you learn when you sit at the table of Jesus, when you fellowship with Jesus. So, to, so today what we need to do is make it our priority is to go out to dinner with Jesus. I know you go to church, but you need to go to dinner with Jesus. Uh, that something happened at the table that's different than nothing when you happen just when you sit at church. Uh, you need to go to Jesus on dinner, not just on Sunday morning. You miss the best part of Jesus uh, when you don't suck with him. Uh, you miss the best part of Jesus until you suck and sit down with him. Until you include him on Monday night and Monday morning, on Tuesday night and Wednesday night, on Thursday morning, on Friday night, on Saturday night, on Sunday morning. You can't see him once a week uh, and get the kind of things that change your heart. You can't see him once a week and get the kind of things that renew your soul. You can't get the kind of the power that he wants to give you just by coming one Sunday morning on an online service. He said, I want to set with you tonight. I want to set to you Monday night. Uh, that, that once a week thing uh, might change your habit, uh, but it won't change your heart. Uh, it may make you break up with a bad relationship, uh, but it won't change your heart. Uh, humbleness is something that happens in the heart. Uh, humbleness is where God deals with your attitude. Humbleness is when you see yourself and the world around you in a different way. And it all happened at the table. Have you been to the table, Jesus? Uh, have you ever sat down with him? Uh, have you allowed him to speak in your
your life. Uh, you see at the table, that's just, that's everyday life that God wants you to be able to sit down with him at the table. He wants to invade your norm. He wants to get in your everyday. Uh, he doesn't want you segregated out to an hour and a half from Sunday morning. See, some of you right now are practicing segregation. Now, you want to segregate Jesus on Sunday, uh, but you don't integrate him on Monday. Uh, you Segregate him just a Sunday, but you don't integrate him to front it. It's time for you to break the bond, the bond, the, the bonds of segregation, uh, and integrate him in every day of your life. Uh, when was the last time Jesus came at your table? When was the last time you done that that you drove to work? Just channel Jesus. Uh, when was the last time uh, he got so in your conversation that people knew you were his? Uh, and of course, a few hours at dinner. What Jesus had done in the course of a few hours at dinner, he shut the mouths of the Pharisees. Uh, he healed the man sick of palsy. Uh, he's taught a class on humility, uh, and they still haven't even served dessert yet. Uh, look at all he's done at dinner. He wants to do the same thing for you on dinner. What he wants you to do is just have a little talk with Jesus. Uh, tell him all about your troubles. Uh, he'll hear your faintest cry. He'll answer our bye bye. When you feel a little prayer, you're turning, uh, and you know a little fire is burning. Uh, you'll find just a little talk of Jesus will make you right. So let us just have a little talk of Jesus. Uh, let him tell him all about our troubles. Uh, he'll hear our faintest cry, and he'll answer by and by. When you feel a little prayer, you're turning. Uh, you know a little fire is burning. All you need is a little fire. A little fire. We can change our household. And it all started at the table. Yeah. At the table. God bless you. God keep you. What table manners? I hope you've learned. Just a few table manners. The meal should heal. Yeah. Yeah. Notice the needs of us. Identify those needs. Humble yourself before the Lord. He will lift you up. Amen. And suck with him. Don't just wait till Sunday morning, Wednesday night. Suck with him throughout all the week. And you'll find therein lies the start of my victory. There it is right there. The more I suck with him. Amen. Join us next week. We still going to be at the table. Next week, we're going to be at the Lord's table. And we're going to be breaking bread together of communion. In preparation for next Sunday services, gather some grape juice. If you don't have grape juice, any type of juice. Because it's the symbolism that's important. Gather some bread. If you don't know living bread, just get you some crackers. If you don't have crackers, any type of bread. Because it's the symbolism that's important. And I'll see you next week at the table.